was simply asking you to explain what those two numbers now mean. So now that we have both of them, what do they actually mean? And we want to use words that would be involved in the problems within the context of this problem. So if we talk about this first one, the whole H of 17, if I ask you what H of 17 would be, look at H. H is that new function that we were introduced with. They're telling you if you took a 17 and plugged it in. So if I go to the other side of the equation, that means I have to plug 17 in for the T on the other side. They're saying if you did that, integrated E minus L from 9 to 17, you're going to get 3,725. So in terms of what that might mean within the context of this problem, Anybody got a thought if that's actually giving us? Because this might be something you have to do that could be a reason we have a file upload question tomorrow. Any thoughts? Yeah, Steve, was that a hand? I saw some fingers pop into your screen. Good. That's pretty much perfect. All right. This is the amount of people in the park. And then if you look at the question I gave you, I didn't print the same version or I don't have on my screen the same version. But if you look at the way this question was answered, when they ask you for the meaning, notice how it says one point for the meaning of H is 17. And then you're going to see the little carrots and it says negative one if no reference to time. So when he said at the time of 17, that's pretty critical because if you don't say specifically at this time, that's what that little carrot with a negative one there means if you don't say at a particular time they're going to take off a really really cheap point the reason this is the amount of people if i integrate the entering rate doesn't that tell me how people have entered if i then integrate the leaving rate that would tell me how many people have left over that eight hour period if i then found the difference in the amount of people that have entered and the amount of people have left over that eight hour period that difference should be the number of people in the park at 17. all right don't say it's the number of people that have entered the park that's not true that's the answer to number a if we just integrate the entering rate this is the amount of people specifically at time t equals 17 that are still in the park all right that's good steve it's perfect all right, h prime to 17. So now what we did yesterday is we took the derivative of this guy. We then plugged in the value of 17. And when we did that, we got this negative 380. So what would we propose that h prime to 17 with this unit? Because what we left off with right at the end of the period, we talked about how that's a negative answer. And normally when we do this problem and people throw that into the calculator, and they get a negative answer, they all kind of look at me and each other thinking that it's wrong. Okay, that's not wrong. That is a correct numerical value. That's what we wanted. This one, just be careful how we word this. All right, Carter, what do you think, Carter? Not quite, although I hear that a lot. Because when this says the amount of people leaving the park at that time, what that would simply be the leaving rate is just... L of X, that's it. L of X is only, or the leaving rate is only L of X. It's not the combination of both of these. Remember what this would have been now. So this would have been E of X minus L of X. So H prime to 17 is now E of 17 minus L of 17. So it's not the amount of people that are leaving the park at that time. Sefian. Good. It, it's getting much, much better. So what you might not have heard at home, he said it is the rate of change that people are entering and leaving. We want to be a little more specific and descriptive. In particular with the sign here. Yeah, Aaron, what do you think? I would take that somewhat. She says there would be 380 more people leaving that are entering at that time. They would probably take that. All right, that's a pretty, pretty decent amount, sort of. Here, here's what we want to get at also. So both of those are good. What we're going to put, though, is this. And they both set it in a different way. So the amount of people 
in the park. So if H is the amount of people in the park, wouldn't H prime be the rate of change in the amount of people in the park? So that's kind of what Carter said. That's what they said. So the amount of people in the park is, and then here's a pretty critical idea. This is also something that you want to be aware of when we answer these questions. They want you to equate what this negative sign means in words. So what this is telling us, since we have a negative rate of change, and it's kind of what Aaron said, the amount of people in the park is decreasing at a rate of 380, I don't remember what that decimal was, whatever the rest of those decimals were. I didn't throw it into the calculator right before the class. I have something else in the calculator right now. So whatever that decimal is, think about what that unit would be. That would have to be at a rate of 380, whatever, people per hour. And then you must, again, say specifically at the time of T equals 17 hours or 5 p.m. if you put it into regular old time. They want you to use this word in the place of that negative symbol. And it's something you just have to be aware of. If you didn't, you wouldn't have gotten that point. You don't want to say it's decreasing at a rate of a negative 180, because if we're decreasing at a negative rate, that actually means we're increasing. So the decreasing is just taking the place of that negative sign. Okay? All right, letter D. Hopefully that makes some sense. Letter D now is asking you, um, on what time on the closed interval, notice how this is a closed interval here, will the model predict that the number of people in the park is a maximum? Typically what this is, we did one of these the other day, we revisit this idea of a candidate. When we're looking for an absolute maximum number of people, we have to explore our candidates. What that normally means, you better list your candidates, which we want to show. They weren't real big on this one for this particular question. And the reason for that is if we went back and read the problem, remember how they tell you the number of people in the park at the beginning is zero? So there aren't any people in there, so that can't be our answer. And then there's also then the assumption that when the park closes, there are again zero people. So those two candidates cannot be our answer. So we're missing that third candidate. Keep in mind what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize the number of people in the park. Recall H of T, that equation gives you the number of people in the park. So this equation is what we are trying to maximize. This whole little nine to 17, integrating e of x minus l of x. This is the number of people in the park equation. So to find another candidate, we need to take the derivative of that, <clears throat> see where it's zero, see where it would be undefined. Well, zero, or the derivative we've already done, right? That would have been your answer to part C, or at least part of your answer to part C. The whole derivative and the integral canceling. Oh wait, I'm sorry. This shouldn't be a 17 right now, this should be a T. So when those cancel, we just end up with E of T minus L of T. What we then need to be able to do is figure out when does that equal zero. So we're going to set that equal to zero. It's when our derivative is undefined or set equal to zero. We are then left with this. Think about what this now means you need to do and why this is definitely on the calculator portion of the test. E of t is the function at the top of the page. L of t is the next function at the top of the page. If you think you're going to set these equal or set it up like this and solve this by hand, that's going to keep you busy for a very, very, very long time. So this is something we now need to solve on our calculator. It's something else we haven't done in a little while, although there was a question on the assignment with this. We now need to use our calculator to solve this equation here. So if you think back when we did all those zeros back in first semester, what we did is graph them. When we graph them, we looked for their zero. That's when we crossed the x-axis. So that's what we want to now set up. So if you go to your calculator, we want to graph that equation. So notice how this is e of t minus l of t. 
go ahead and graph that. And then I want you to see what you think that answer is going to be. See if we can then kind of get through all of this. Because there is a little trick to this. If you again look at the answers and how they delegated the points for this, while we're using our calculator, you had to show what you're doing. So you needed to show them that you took E of T minus L of T, set it equal to zero. And then the next thing is just the answer. So now we use our calculator, get the answer, and then we should be good. Kind of messy to plug in. Like I said yesterday, this is, was a you know, 10, 15 minute question all by itself. When you graph that, my guess for most of us, you won't like what you see. So I talked about there's really only four things they're ever going to ask you to do on the calculator. One is a math nine, so you're going to do that tomorrow. One is a math eight, you're going to do that tomorrow. One of them is to solve an equation using a zero function. You're going to do that right now and tomorrow. The fourth thing is be able to change your window for where this function is defined. So if you don't have the correct window for this, when I hit graph right now, there's nothing there. You got nada, nothing. So if we then understand when is this function defined, then we've got to play with our window a little bit. So this function was defined from the time of 9 a.m. in the morning until 23, so 11 p.m. at night. Now if I hit enter and I don't see this, then we have a problem. Now we have to have some place where this graph crosses the x-axis between 9 and 23. When you hit graph, you still won't like what you see necessarily, but we will at least see our graph, hopefully thinking really there it is so the answer to this question is right here that's the answer to our question because that's when this function that difference has a value of zero so we're going to do second calc zero so revisit that idea number two if you now use your arrows to jump around it's really hard to find them right because he jumps and you can't even really tell is he to the left or to the right because that almost looks like a vertical line so your other option if i know this is nine the beginning of my window is nine and the end of my window is 23 can we all reasonably assume that like x equals 10 x equals 11 is to the left of our answer so instead of using your arrows just manually type in 11 and hit enter and I've now set my interval at 11. If this is 23, then 22 is very clearly to the right of the zero that I'm looking for. So I'm just gonna manually type in 22 and it will now set my bound on the right. So as long as this answer lies in between your two vertical lines where your window is set, hit enter. And then that's our answer at 15.795. That's when this model would predict that the most number of people were in the park. All right, so that 15.7, if I can remember that, 15, I already forgot it. What is it? 795. 795. They don't ask for hours or units. I want to put them. It's just 15.795. A lot of times, and they don't in this case, the next problem will. Think about if they would have asked you, well, how many, what is the maximum number of people in the park? The next question is going to ask you this. Wouldn't we then now take that value? We'd have to throw it into our equation and then come up with that numerical value. They don't in this case, but it's a really, really common question. And we're going to do it in the next problem. Right. In this case, all we want is the time, so that's it. Any questions on that? That's a lot there. Okay. Then the next page. Very, very similar. And you'll see, you can, if you're ever bored, hop on the uh, College Board site. Every year there's a question like this. They change it from water to an amusement park to you know, all kinds of random funny stories that they come up with, but they're ultimately the same exact question. So if you read this one now, instead of people entering a park, you have water pumped into an underground tank at a constant rate of eight gallons per minute. So I'm gonna define that down here. 
So we'll do the rate that it goes in is equal to eight gallons per minute. Then you were told that water is going to leak out of the tank at a rate of root T plus one gallons per minute. So our out rate is now a variable rate. So this will always be changing and it's defined by that function. Again, that's a velocity unit. So just keep that in mind, that's our rate. Your interval in this case is zero to 120. Unlike our last problem where there were no people in the park at the beginning, now you are given an initial amount. So at the beginning, the tank had 30 gallons of water in it. Letter A, we spent all day on these. Answer letter A real quick. Make sure we remember what we did yesterday. And then throw it into your calculator. The calculator should do the majority of this work. We're looking for how many gallons leak out. What you were given is the out rate in a unit of gallons per minute. So if we want to go from gallons per minute to gallons, we're going from our rate to our amount. Then we would know that we want to integrate that function. Come on, you. Because this has a unit of gallons per minute multiply that by minutes we do that with our dt and in this case we're going zero two three <clears throat> this can actually be done without a calculator we're going to cheat was it 14 thirds is that what we get yeah okay like yeah so 4.6 repeating is that what we all, get? all right and then that's our answer they don't ask you for limits the limits are implied right how many gallons so that answer is implied to have a unit of gallons so don't be throwing that down just in case you screw it up all right so that's b or a uh, do b see what you think for b also hopefully pretty nice yeah carter um, uh, it doesn't matter, like on this question, tomorrow you're going to need to put in a decimal form because that's how I can put the answers into our testing stuff. Okay, and I'll make that clear tomorrow. B. This one now takes into account everything, right? Like A is just asking how much water leaked out. So we only had to deal with that exiting rate. Letter B is now asking how many gallons do you actually have at three minutes? So the order in which you do this doesn't really matter. The way I'm going to do it is, is what I would hope is sort of intuitive, the natural way to kind of think about this. And that is the idea that we start with 30. So we had to take into account how much did we start with. So whether you put that first or not is up to you. And then don't we have some water entering? And we can calculate that pretty quickly because here is our entering rate over here, all right, this eight gallons per minute, and we're doing it for three minutes. So in that three minute span, we would have come up with 24 gallons of water being added. Also in that first three minutes though, didn't we in the first answer figure that in those first three minutes, we would have lost 14 thirds gallons per minute. Not a lot of calculus here, just some common sense. What did we start with? How much did we lose? How much did we gain? Whatever all that added together is, is your final answer. B, that's, that's a completely acceptable answer. If this is a free response question, which it is, if you leave that, you're getting all of your points. Multiple choice tomorrow, if it's a multiple choice question, then obviously you're going to have to do that, figure out what that is. 
know what that is, 54 minus 14 thirds. Um, but whatever that is, is your answer. But that's a completely acceptable for your response answer. And that's what I would actually tell you to leave just so you don't screw something up and save some time. Okay. Letter C is the big one. This is why I want to do this problem, C and then D. In the previous question, they gave you the equation for the number of people in the park at any time. This question is now asking you to come up with that. So write an expression for A of T. That would give you the total number of gallons of water in the tank at any time T. Do that real quick and see if we can do this. There are three different versions that would be acceptable. So it's it's an extension of, of B. B, we found out how much water is in the tank specifically at time three. C is now saying, well, let's come up with an expression that wouldn't only work for three, but would work for any time that I wanted between zero and 120. And see what you think. All right, let's see if we can get some of these versions here. So if, if the version we throw down first isn't what you have, just hang tight. Anybody want to throw one out that they have? There's really three different routes we could take with this. You brave souls. Sifian, what do you have, bud? Uh, the, You said quantity of this? Like that? And then what? Is it a plus one in there? Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else got a version? I won't confirm or deny if that's all the way correct or not. So don't freak out if it's not the exact same. Yeah, Nick, what do you got, Nick? All right, we got another version. I'm sure, there's some more out there. No brave souls. Ryan, we got Ryan. Like that? Okay. Safian, you want to add anything to yours? Okay. So Safian's going to add his 30 right here. All right. And then we want to talk about these. Um, because there is a third version that one of them kind of meshes in with the other two. So there is a third one. So all of them, I would start with a 30. You don't necessarily have to put that first, but I think it just makes sense. That's the initial amount, so we're going to start with 30. Then they each decided to do add next. So this person did 8T, so it's 8 gallons per minute multiplied by however many minutes. This person integrated the entering rate. So if I just integrate the entering rate from 0 to T, this should give us the amount that we have gained over whatever time period I'm asking about. So what you want to just be a little bit careful about, and this happens a lot, so I'm glad we got this one. So thank you. We don't want to combine this version and this version together, and that's kind of what happened right here. So it's one of two things. It's either just 8t or it's the integration of just 8. All right. 
Does that make sense? So for this, let's get rid of his T right here, and then we're good. And then now this guy and this guy are the same. So the third option that sometimes people will do is they'll actually set these up separately and do an integral from zero to T, integrating the entering rate, and then set up a third integral, zero to T, integrating this T plus a one. Those are all acceptable for the most part. There's one little thing that you just want to be a little bit careful of. But do we understand that idea? And then let's go back to the previous problem. Notice how in the original setup of this problem, we had t's for our variable right here. So e of t, and then we have t throughout, l of t, t throughout. Look at how when they wrote the amount function, though, did they do 9 to t and then leave these as functions of time? They did not. Notice how they use a different variable. They chose to use x. We need to do the same thing. And then I'll try to explain why that's important. So for every single one of these, we want this to be t. But if I have an integral, so I am going to erase this t. You can put any variable you want other than t. I'm going to use x. And then here we're going to use a dx. If I go to the next version within the integral, I'm going to get rid of this t and this t. I'm going to use x. And then x, the next one, here's the t within the integral here. So those need to be x's. And then this one is an x. And then this one is an x. So whatever version you picked, when we rewrite those as integrals, within the integrand itself, we don't want t's. And here's why. Um, let's say this 0 to t. Let's just do this guy right here. And then let's say I leave this as a t plus a 1 versus a 0 to t, and I use a different variable. So we understand why this is important. If I want you to define uh, H of, a of 10, don't I only want to plug 10 in for the upper limit? If I don't have a different variable here, aren't I technically doing now the integration of 0 to 10, and wouldn't my entering rate or my leaving rate, my drain rate, now just be a root 11 all the time? It's a constant rate. That's not a constant rate. That's why we have to assign a different variable, where if I do it with this one, wouldn't I now only be plugging in 10 for the t, and my function now remains a variable function, which is what we want. So it's something very, very small. But it's obviously when they can see your work, it's important to know that small stuff so we don't lose that point. Do we follow that? Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. So that's the answer to letter C. Either one of those versions, whichever one you prefer. Yeah, Aaron? No, because it's not inside of the integral. So if I, let's say, she asks in this second version, would I need to change this T right here? And the answer is no, because now let's say I wanted you to find A of 3 from above. Don't we want to do 8 times 3 right here? Yeah, so we don't want to have a different variable. We want to plug in the, the 3 for that T. All right, so now letter D. I am going to use, so I'm going to erase some of this so we can keep this small. But letter D is just saying, similar to our last question, in this closed interval here, the amount of water in the tank is a maximum at what time? And then justify your answer. So again, this now is a candidate question where we now have to identify this. So when they say justify, okay, when they make this statement here, justify your answer, they're asking to see that you've considered all of your candidates. We definitely now have to concern about ourselves at the beginning because we had 30 gallons of water at the beginning. So there's nothing saying that that wasn't our, our max. If we had more water leave than came in, then the beginning is the max. We also could be doing it at 120. We need to figure out how much that is. And then more than likely, we can get a third candidate, at least a third candidate, through our derivative, setting that equal to zero, seeing where it's undefined, all that good stuff. So I am going to use one of the versions above. I'm going to use this version, the 
plus the integral from 0 to t, and then 8 minus root x plus a 1 dx. That's the one that we want to maximize. That's when we want to take our derivative of to get our third candidate. We'll set that equal to 0 and figure out where we go from positive to negative. So the 30 would go away. Popped up yesterday for the first time in a little while. Now we're doing it for a second time. That means now over here we're taking the derivative of the integral. The derivative and the integral would cancel. All we would be left with then is the 8 minus now that t gets substituted in. And we would just end up with that. So that's our derivative. We would look to see, is our derivative undefined anywhere? It is, but it's for negative times. And our function is defined for 0 to 120. So we don't have to worry about that. But we can definitely set this equal to 0 and come up with a third candidate. So set that equal to 0. Solve that. And we now have our third candidate. Then, like we want to do with our candidates, now that we know one of these three has to be our answer here, what we now really need to know is how much water did we have at the end? How much water in the tank did we have at 63? So wouldn't it be nice if we had an equation that we could plug 63 into, we could plug 120 into, and then that would tell us how much water is in the tank at those times. That would be nice, correct? Well, that's your answer to part C. That's what part C gave us. It's the amount of water in the tank at any time we want. So I'm going to use this version. This is the one that I use for part D. But now all we are going to do is take this equation that I have highlighted in blue, definitely calculator. You're going to take 120, plug it in. You're going to take 63 and plug it in. And we're going to see how much water is in the tank at those two different times. Okay. So go ahead. Let's just do this. I'm going to do 120 first. This is our initial 30. We're going to be integrating our entering amount, our leaving amount, our draining amount. That difference should tell us how much we've changed from the 30. Add that, and we get 103.3 gallons. So that's how much water we have at the end of the interval. And then don't re-enter all of that. Just do a real quick second entry. Pull that right back up. And then just change your upper limit. We want to do it at 63. And enter. That's how much water we had at the time of 63. So 193.3. Then you don't really have to explain it. You don't have to put this into words. It says justify. So as long as this is here. All I was asking for was our time. Our time is 63. Then, since we have five minutes, let me show you what you could have taken. To me, this is much, much easier. We don't have to use words. You don't have to explain it. Here's another option we could have done. Long time ago when we did these, remember how we had endpoints, and then we would have had a test point of 63? We could have set up this little sign chart. Let's see people in here. Let's take some numbers and plug it in. So let's plug in, here's my derivative. Plug in good numbers, so I'm going to plug in the number 3. Ah, come on, change colors. Because if I do 3 plus 1, that's the square root of 4, which is 2. 8 minus 2 is 6, so I'm going to get positive. So wasn't the amount of water in our tank increasing until 63 minutes? If I plug in, I'll use 80, so that I can do 80 plus 1 and get a nice perfect square. Root 81 is 9. 8 minus 9 is negative. Then the amount of my water in the tank decreased until I hit 120. That would make 63 the biggest. 
The issue is this doesn't serve as justification. They don't accept sign charts. You would have to put this into words. And I would just discourage you from using words as much as possible. There's a reason they don't want you using words because you just have to say one little thing incorrectly and then you don't get that justification point. But this is old idea. And it would have also told us that the 63 was the time where we had our match. Any question with that? Any question on anything else? We have three minutes. Anything we need to talk about before tomorrow? I will hop on again the class link at 930 if you have any last questions. So if you looked over that quiz review and you aren't sure about why something is what I have, ask. I'll pop in at 930. All right, you can ask those questions then. Yeah, Steve, you got something real quick? I'm just wondering, suppose the AP test to get one for justification point, do you have to like put something like in the edge specifically, or do they just like look at your work? So when they say justify, they're really just looking, they're, you should be able to do this mathematically. So when they say just, if you have this, you're totally okay. You don't have to write anything else. That is your justification. If they say the word explain, so they want you now to legitimately explain, that translates to words. You have to put it into words. This doesn't count as a justification. You would have to write out into words that the amount of tank at the time of zero was 30. My derivative between zero and 63 was positive. Therefore, the amount of water in the tank increased until 63. And then you got to say the derivative was negative. We decreased. It's just a lot of words. It's a lot of writing. And the more you write, the more time it's just going to take for you to finish. So this would have been all you would have needed to get this justification point. Okay. All right, anything else? All right, then, since we have two minutes, I'm going to use this two minutes now. I don't know if your other AP teachers have talked to you about this or have told you about this or if you've heard about this, but the College Board has left three different dates open for AP testing. And then every course is going to be able to select which date. So the original date of May 4th or 5th for us, I don't remember off the top of my head which one it is. That's an option still. They're going to do a second option. It's really for schools that are just behind. That's, I believe, May 24th for us. And then there is a third option that's the middle of June, like June 10th or something. I get to pick solely because I'm the only calculus BC teacher. So if your teachers of other AP courses have already talked about this. All right, we're going to stick to the original date. We're certainly not going into June. That was never an option. And then May 24th, that's, I believe, right around graduation. I think some of you are gone. I just don't necessarily think it's a great idea to prolong everything. I think we're going to be fine to get done by May 4th. So if you hear that, just know we're still going to be going with the original date of it's either May 4th or 5th. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's that first Tuesday, though, of AP testing. So just keep that in mind. If other AP tests get moved, uh, we're going to keep it the same as what it was at the beginning. OK. OK. Um, I'm not sure. All right, we'll see you guys. I'm not sure the last day of seniors. Um, I believe 